There's a book launch, and I've been to many, is to enable the egregiously egotistic writer to talk <laughs> about himself or herself and how they created this, last, this latest inspiring masterpiece. I'll break that convention by starting by talking about you. Yarl, as they say in the south of America. Um, because there are some remarkable people here, and in a way you represent a kind of cross-section of a running community which wouldn't have existed 50 years ago. I'll start with our host and hosts. I mean, you, you know Hamish French and his staff uh, for their huge long-term contribution to, to running and its community through the Shoe Clinic nationwide. Uh, and the outstanding reputation for providing real service and expert advice. Shoe Clinic is also a major sponsor of many running events. Some of you may know, perhaps, that Hamish is also a key member of the Wellington Over 50 cricket team <laughs> that triumphed in this season's national championship. <laughs> Probably very few of you know also in Hamish's life uh, that two or three weeks ago he and his beautiful nun were married. Oh, nun can't be here tonight, uh, otherwise I got a whole tribute to her, but I'll, I'll pass that. But this is a chance for the Wellington running community, Hamish, to wish you and nun both congratulations and the hope that you will live happily ever after. Give me with special greetings to my family, uh, my son Tom and, and grandson. I came across a certificate that Tom made for me when he was eight years old. Um, after watching me win a race in Christchurch, and it says, Mr. Robinson, you are fast. <laughs> <laughs> well done, D O N. <laughs> Much treasure. Also in the room of friends so long-standing and so close that they count as family. Uh, mostly runners, all of those subscribers to, to the mantra that the older we get, the faster we used to run. <laughs> and I won't name you all, but um, I will thank the clubs uh, who have helped to promote this event and, and who have remained good friends, Wellington Harriers, Scottish Olympic, Wellington Marathon Clinic and others, will forgive me if I give special recognition to Victoria University Athletic Club. Uh, an important part of my life for, and I counted, 49 years at this, uh, this, at this point. And one way in which I've tried to give back into the sport that, that I love and has, that has given me such richness in my life is by creating the Victoria University of Wellington Roger Robinson Scholarship for Student Runners. And I'm delighted to say that tonight's scholar is here, Maya Flint. Maya, first season on the track and also already an international mountain runner and also the parents of a former scholar uh, Emma Douglas Ruth and Darren Douglas are here Emma is not here but but her parents are here somewhere well, they were <laughs> still, still into, the, into that community and also connected with that scholarship I also especially want to welcome uh, the then Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences who enable the scholarship to come into being, along with the Victoria University Foundation, and they are also represented here with Christina, and Gregor Kossa uh, was the Dean of Health Sciences and is himself a major triathlete. And, and they, well, I think the simple says that uh, Gregor Kossa twisted my arm to create the scholarship, so. <laughs> <laughs> Running, of course, has changed over, over 50 years. Um, and in the room, there are some significant leaders of that change. I, I, I don't see Arthur Clapp yet, but he might have come. And um, Michael Jakes, the organizers of the Scottish Waterfront Run with that weekly 5K, the organizers of the Honest, Wellington Harriers Honest 10K, 261 Fearless. These are all variants of running and opportunities for people to run that didn't exist 50 years ago when the pattern was, was quite different. Um, a few other notables, um, just forgive me for mentioning these, but, but there, there are some interesting people here. 
Kevin Norkey, the, the absolute outstanding journalist with, with stuff, who I remember as a rival running for Wellington Harriers. Where's Kevin? Still here somewhere. Oh, hi. Um, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just pause and say, I, th I always think it was Kevin who was responsible for the funniest encouragement for a runner that I can remember in my career. I'd taken off in, in the Round the Rangers relay in Palmerston North, something like 15 seconds ahead of Dick Quacks, who was running for Auckland University. I held him off for maybe two miles, and then inevitably, Quacks, he came sailing majestically past me. <laughs> At which point, a voice from a parked car, unmistakably Norkies, said, Go on, Rog, hit him again. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, cl so close friend, Erica McLean, is here from a totally different context. Um, and, oh, a welcome, please, to Ken Stafford, who is a visiting American with a group studying landscape architecture and recreational trails in this area with our, our friend Ross Jackson, who because of, for health reasons, hospital treatment today, is not here. And one more, and this is for me a significant one. I want to recognize Peter Biggs. And in particular, there are many reasons why you could recognize Peter Biggs, you know, like having been head of Creative New Zealand and all that kind of thing, huge sponsor of the arts and literature in this country. But my particular thanks to him is that he and Mary, as organizers of the Featherstone Book Festival, have put on the only session in the history of book festivals in this country devoted to sports writing as a literary form. Nobody else thinks that sport counts as writing, as, as literature. Nobody else. When Auckland did one, they wanted it to be about the social significance of sport. And I said, I don't really want to come along and be part of Sociology 101. <laughs> I want my books to be considered as you might consider other writers' books, because they're well written. Peter and Mary are the only people who gave that opportunity. <coughs> the other speakers on that occasion uh, were Suzanne McFadden, the outstanding uh, Auckland journalist and author of a brilliant book called Striking Gold, uh, and uh, Keith Quinn whose autobiography is a delight. So Peter, thank you for that. And there are some of my university colleagues here as well. I, I won't name them, but, but the, their, their lasting friendship is, is deeply valued. Coming closer to the book, uh, I want to thank three people here. No, two people here. Uh, one, one isn't. Uh, who contributed unique material to the research basis of it. One who's not here is, is David Carnegie, my colleague, who did research into running footmen, races between running footmen as an element of drama in the early 1600s, which nobody had ever done before. I noticed one or two things. David picked up that, that ball, that research ball, and ran with it. He's an absolute expert on Jacobean drama and did some really significant work, which I then plagiarized and put into, <laughs> <laughs> and put, and put into this book. Uh, second, who contributed to the book in that, in that kind of way is Alan Stevens, uh, who has made endless contributions to the sport in New Zealand as president, as team manager, uh, as, as life member of Scottish and many other things. But in this case, he's, he's also a compulsive preserver of archives. And he's kept all the agendas and minutes of every athletics New Zealand and world athletics meeting that he's ever attended. He gave me access to those and I was able to rewrite the history of becoming a professionalism into New Zealand. Very important piece of work. It's in very brief form in the Alison Road chapter in this book. Alan Stevens, thank you for that. And the third person, of course, is Catherine. Uh, being married to Catherine, is a bit like living in a research library, uh, <laughs> specializing in the history of women's running. Well, no, it's a lot more fun than that, actually. <laughs> 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 but, but from Catherine, I got direct first person eyewitness accounts of Jesse Owens, who was a, a, a fellow speaker with her on occasions in America. I got all the material about how the women's marathon got into the Olympic Games. Uh, and I got absolute inside view of the policy of 
Avon Cosmetics senior management regarding, Atala regarding yes, Atalanta's nipples, <laughs> which had to be shaved off. Read, 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 read the acknowledgments. <laughs> Uh, I suppose what, what I'm proud of, I, what I tried to do in this book was to tell the stories well and to get them right. Those, those two things, the getting right was important to me as a scholar. And some myths had to be demolished, you know, and, and, and I'm sorry, Philippides didn't drop dead and say rejoice and conquer. Um, there was no mystery woman marathoner in Athens in 1868, or if there was, we have absolutely no reliable evidence of who she was or what she did. Violet Piercy did not run a measured marathon in the 1920s and 30s. The royal children were not watching the start of the marathon from the nursery, as had always been said, but were out visibly in photographs on the lawn of Windsor Castle. Uh, Conan Doyle was not the medical officer who accompanied Durando Pietri across the finish line. As almost every web website says, if you, if you Google Conan Doyle, Durando Pietri, or Conan Doyle Olympics, you'll find that he's the guy with the moustache. He wasn't. Uh, he was in the stand covering it for um, the Daily Mail. And he then, I noticed, incorporated a reference to Durando Pietri by name in the story that he was writing at that point, Wisteria Lodge, and an article on, on that subject by me appeared a few months ago in the Sherlock Holmes Mystery Magazine. If I was still at the university, I don't know how many PBRF points I'd get for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> um, I found the first um, documentary records of the beginnings of, of the sport, real documentary records, and not just Greek poems, I don't mean, I mean actually newspapers and, and photographs and record books. Um, I found the first illustration of cross country, sketched by the schoolboy Samuel Butler, who then came on to New Zealand and became, of course, a major writer. Um, other research was I mean, some researchers in newspapers, like all the New York newspapers, to find out the wonderful story of marathon mania in, in 1909. Italians and, and Irish crowds, huge crowds, beating each other up uh, in, the, in the indoor stadiums where the marathons were run over 238 laps of, of an indoor track, with everybody choking with cigarette smoke. Ama amazing stories. Um, did all, that was all newspaper research, but some of the research was also outdoors. Like when I ran halfway around Shropshire trying to find a wet ditch, uh, <laughs> which I did, which is important in the, in the life story of Samuel Butler, who, who, which, is, which is why I found out about all, all of that. And then, as Catherine said, looking at all the records and the scraps of film footage of the 1928 Women's Olympic 800 meters and the appalling, uh, really disgraceful conspiracy of fake journalism uh, that that race um, would, was reported by. Uh. So if you want to know exactly why, where Pheidippides ran and why, read this book. If you want to know exactly why the marathon is 26 miles, 385 yards. Uh, read this book. The disconcerting thing is that the course clerk, called Jack Andrews, reporting the distance around the track was 385 yards, but he said about the distance from Windsor to the track was about 36 miles. <laughs> Nobody's ever explained why that word about <laughs> has been <laughs> religiously interpreted as exactly. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to blame somebody, well, well, you can think about that next time you run a marathon. Um, and, and I also established exactly who shoved who in the last lap of the Billy Mills 10,000 meters in Tokyo in 1964. And that, that involved getting talking to and corresponding with Billy Mills and Barry McGee and Ron Clark uh, and Bruce Kidd. So kind of international eyewitnesses. A good story should create a context and should also get inside as, as, as well as outside, if it possibly can. So I tried to take the reader inside Jack Lovelock, inside Alison Rowe, um, who, by the way, was going to come to this, but had to back out at the last minute. She emailed just yesterday 
I say she's got house commitment. She was going to be our surprise guest. But she sends uh, her, her very best regards. Uh, and bought something like 12 copies of the book, so she's my best customer. <laughs> <laughs> for, all, for all her grandchildren. Um, and so let me just, um, I thought I'd just read one, one bit from a, a, a chapter which I like. Uh, partly because it starts in a place where I, I know from running, where I used to go from Cambridge Newmarket race course in England, and it finishes in a pub. So, so, it's a, so it's a nice combination. And it's a chapter about the running footman called Helen Fury Sykes. And it starts on New, Newmarket Heath, February 1719. The lean racehorses are in the stables, warm under their blankets, pressing their proud hoofs on the trampled straw. The wintry heath outside is dank and misty, too cold for thoroughbred horses. Today, a different kind of race has brought crowds, color, excitement, and money to Newmarket. Two running footmen are ready for a match foot race over two miles on two laps of the thick grass of the Rowley Mile course. It's not an easy course with an uphill slope that drains energy on this footing. Match means just the two of them, head to head, like a boxing championship. There is rich prize money and the sums gambled during that era, era were mind-boggling. The two footmen prance in their rival liveries of coloured jackets, breeches tucked into high white socks, leather shoes and a cap, much like the apparel of a modern jockey. Their breath shows white in the chill damp air of the low-lying ground of East Anglia, only a few miles from the watery fens. Their aristocratic patrons in long ornate coats and elaborate curling white powdered wigs cluster expectantly near gilt coaches surrounded by their guests and followers. Pastel coloured cloaks and long white skirts that sweep and swish on the grass mark the few women. Grooms stand quietly by the coach horses and servants prowl about with refreshments. The bookmakers are on the fringes of the scattered crowd. Some eager boys wanting a better view climb up on one of the dome-shaped Bronze Age burial mounds that still dot the edge of the race course. The race begins, they go out fast, with big partisan crowds, high stakes, just two competitors <coughs> inexperienced at pace control under pressure in racing, we can imagine how fervently they would begin. The newspaper report says, this is it word for word, the complete report. Last Tuesday, the second match between the Duke of Wharton's running footman and the Lord Castlemaine's was run at Newmarket for several hundred guineas, and the Duke's man won. Both of them ran with such fury and violence that though it was but a two-mile course, they dropped down for dead when they came in. The original weekly journal, February 14, 1719, the significance of that it is, is the first extant piece of sports journal. <laughs> Earliest date of any newspaper report of a sporting event other than horse racing. It actually sounds like a so horse race. Sorry? It sounded like a horse race. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, they described it. And of course, you had to notice that they dropped down for dead. It's probably certainly written by Daniel Defoe, <laughs> which, which is how I came to find it. Uh, because I was, ch I was doing some work on Defoe in Britain, and he, he was an absolute ace, brilliant, really important journalist. And he was, he was Appleby of this original weekly journal, which became Appleby's original weekly journal. There's no proof as by Defoe, but it's, but it's very, very probable. Uh, and that's partly why it's good, short, tight, full of action, just like Robinson Crusoe fighting the footprint or something. And that chapter finishes, it takes us through the footmen, um, many of whom became highwaymen and footpads. I can't think of this connection between running and crime, I don't know why we, were, <laughs> we, can, we can speculate on that. Uh, and there's a pub in London that Catherine and I have always liked going to called I Am The Only Running Footman. Uh, and probably it's called that because there must have been a rival footman pub or something. But anyway, that's it. that is its formal name. I am the only running footman. So, a running tourist, I end, end this chapter, can sip a pint of English beer in the bar of I am the only running footman and enjoy the redolence of so much unpretentious running history. Here, 
Warbone, Groves, and Sykes, and I named those Warbone and Groves, are the two who ran that race, tracked down their names. Fit, lean, mileage hardened men used to share a drink and a joke. Here, no doubt, they talked, as runners always do. Uh, we'll be doing on Friday, okay? uh, Of last week's race and next week's, and whether the course was short, complained about the hills or their running shoes, and gossiped about who's in shape and who has the best kick. Maybe they had a laugh about that novelty phenomenon, the weekly newspaper. Maybe one of them read aloud the lurid claim in this week's issue, that in the latest footman race, they ran with such fury and violence that both of them dropped down for dead when they came in. That is, if any of them could read. <laughs> Thank you. So, drinks on the house. <laughs> Enjoy yourselves and welcome to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.